Today, the company began placing more than 200 sticks of dynamite in certain vital places in the structure so the building will collapse on itself with the timed blasts. After the demolition next Tuesday, rescue workers will then be able to dig through rubble finally and locate the bodies of two women still missing after that blast last month that killed 167. In the O.J. Simpson double murder trial today, the defense began cross-examination of a second expert in the science of DNA. As John Gibson reports, this particular expert brought to court the most damaging evidence against O.J. Simpson so far, that he killed his ex-wife and a friend of hers last summer. That's what you can't argue with science, but O.J. Simpson's lawyers are giving it a million-dollar shot. Are you aware uh, of making a mistake? In, in, in any of your forensic DNA typing cases to this point? No, I'm not aware that I've made a mistake in any of my cases. Right. Simpson DNA expert Barry Sheck is trying to show that cross-contamination in the laboratory accounts for the results so damaging to O.J. Simpson. For instance, when lab criminalist Gary Sims handled evidence, did he change gloves? I don't believe I change my gloves after every item. Um, what I do sometimes would be usually to wash my gloves. But in earlier testimony, prosecutor Rock Harmon tried to head off this argument by asking questions that ridicule the cross-contamination theory. Does the DNA of an athletic person that's in a stain have any athletic prowess more than, than a dead person? No. So I'm curious to disregard that question. This is the fulcrum point of the prosecution case, and both sides are getting testy with each other, leading the judge to sharp words. Wait, wait. I'm discussing this with counsel. I'm trying to give him some guidance. Why don't you sit down? It wasn't just the lawyers getting a scolding. Judge Ito today tossed two reporters from the courtroom, not a simple one-day suspension, but a permanent ban. Those two reporters were from Court TV and USA Today. They were kicked out after a juror wrote the judge a note that said their talking was distracting. In a moment, a 100-year-old building in Sioux Falls gets a fresh start for another century of service. And before you get out on the lake, there are some tougher rules for safety enforced this year. The story is coming up on News 5. With the caution flag, the Memorial Day 300 continues at... ...dated 100 years ago today. The Sioux Quartzsite structure has seen two additions in its century of use, including an extra floor. Today, to mark the turning point, the building showed itself off and showed some new citizens the red carpet into America. Cammie Melton reports. ...recommends that they be admitted to citizenship upon taking the oath of allegiance as required by the law. More than 50 people from 27 different countries became U.S. citizens today here at the Sioux Falls Federal Courthouse. This means a lot because uh, my children are American, my husband is American, so I am joining them in the same nationality. I'm now a citizen. I've been here for so long, and yeah, I just couldn't wait until I was 18 to do this. But the rights, advantages, and obligations that go along with being an American had to be earned. Everyone had to pass a U.S. history test. As the naturalization ceremony came to an end, the courthouse centennial celebration began at the other end of the building with tours of the historic site. Mary Jean Elliott Skinner came back to learn more about her grandfather's role in the courthouse's history. I remember as a child, I was 11 when he died, and I remember coming to, prior to that, to visit the courthouse and see the courtroom. And I believe, I have a memory at least, that his picture had already been hung at that time in the courtroom. And uh, it's, it's still there. It was also a day for Tammy Wilka's daughter, Katie, to learn a bit more about the history of this building and the history created in it every day. I used to clerk in this building a couple of years ago for Judge Jones, and so I knew about all of the activities, and I wanted to bring my daughter to see the naturalization ceremony. Making it a day of history for both the new and the lifelong citizens of this country. In Sioux Falls, Cammie Melton, News 5. With the return of sunshine to South Dakota, many boaters are itching for a return to the water. But this year, there are some new requirements added to boating for safety. Before, boats under 16 feet in length did not have to have life jackets for every passenger. This year, they do. And as John Austin reports, violators could face a $50 fine for every life jacket they do not have, or worse. 
South Dakota voters spent a fatality-free summer in 1994, but a look at the record offers a strong endorsement to this year's Coast Guard requirement that all boats be equipped with an approved personal flotation device for every passenger on board. Smaller boats with life jackets not aboard or not on were blamed for even more tragedy here than the national average, where 85% of all boating fatalities were not wearing an approved flotation device. We know from our fatality statistics that uh, of the 800 people who die in boating accidents, some 600 are dying of wet lung drowning. In many cases, nearly all, they are not wearing life jackets. Our goal is to get people to wear those PFDs and prevent those preventable fatalities. During the summers of 1991, 92, and 93, all nine of South Dakota's boating fatalities were not wearing a life jacket, and eight of them in crafts where the PFD was not required in boats of 10, 13, and 14 feet in length. The National Boating Safety Council will kick off its annual push next week with the common sense message that life jackets don't work if they're not worn. Today's life jackets come in so many different colors and shapes and sizes that they're much more comfortable than they ever have been in the past. Slipping one on yourself and especially on your child should be as automatic as putting on a seatbelt in a car. And just like the frequency of accidents in shorter neighborhood trips far exceeding longer drives where the seatbelt is more commonly remembered, most boating fatalities occur on nice days in calm water with very little common sense. John Austin, News 5. Well, Memorial Day is coming up, and with it, the traditional vacation travel season across America. After a long, cold winter and a long, wet spring, many people are ready for a getaway. But as Beth Fuller reports tonight, if you don't have your plans made already, you may be out of luck. The American Automobile Association predicts more than 26 million motorists will hit the road Memorial Day weekend. And like past years, it will cost travelers more to get to their destination. Because as summertime demand for gas increases, so does the price. According to AAA of South Dakota, statewide a gallon of gas costs about $1.21 a gallon. That's slightly more than the national average of $1.20. Local retailers say factors other than Memorial Day force prices up. I know Memorial Weekend for us is a, is a huge weekend, so, um, but we, we don't jump the prices unless we have no choice. If your plans include a visit to one of the state parks, you better call now and make reservations. Many of them are already filled up, and here at the Palisades, they only have four spots left for Memorial Day weekend. But if your first choice campground is already booked, then the State Parks Department may be able to help you come up with a plan B. If you call uh, for Lewis and Clark and, and they don't have any sites left, uh, the people at the reservation center can uh, check another park and, and, and find you a place to camp, hopefully. If weather cooperates, more than 100,000 people could fill state parks and campgrounds, making it the busiest Memorial Day weekend ever. At Palisade State Park, Beth Fuller, News 5. About 20 people were hurt, two of them seriously today, when a tornado slashed through a busy mall near Nashville, Tennessee. As Cynthia Williams reports, the twister left a wide path of destruction in a very congested area. Sheets of rain were blowing through, and, and the van rocked back and forth, and the windows just exploded. Nashville's Rivergate Mall looked like a war zone. Store windows were disintegrated, roofs were blown off buildings, trees were toppled, and power lines blew down. The tornado hit around lunchtime, a time when the mall was packed with employees as well as customers. And then I just told them to get back in because we got a tornado out here. Most people were inside stores in the tornado's path and terrified. And I heard someone say, get to the back of the store, and I ran. <laughs> Officials are amazed that more people weren't seriously injured or killed. They're totaling up the damage and counting their blessings. Also in Tennessee, a tornado killed three people and injured at least 20 others in the town of Etheridge. And I have a feeling you're going to say those were not the only two tornadoes today. Well, yeah, there's uh, at least now coming in reports of at least 40 tornadoes alone in Tennessee. We'll tell you why all that severe weather is occurring. Plus, spell out our weather after this has paid off.